Reporters for Vice News travel the world, putting a human face to the world's most important stories. There's a solid wall of riot police officers. But now we introduce you to them. They're doing CPR on one of the casualties here. We don't know if he's going to make it. This is Field Notes, a show that sits down with our reporters to find out the stories behind their stories and how they got so close to the action. Feeling pretty good about that? In this episode, we'll talk to the team that's been reporting on a national reckoning in Canada over the country's brutal treatment of Indigenous children, a problem that isn't just buried in the past. Go, go, go! Parents weren't told, here's what we're going to do to your kids when you, you know, you drop your kids off. Here's what we're really going to do to them. That's not spoken of. They tell you that we're going to feed your children, we're going to look after them, we're going to educate them. And so it's, it's very false and misleading what they were saying because that is not the truth. What is it like to come back here to this place? I've been away from here, like away from this, this particular site for so many years, I just didn't bother with it. It could be just a cruel place, and so you have to know how to really stick up for yourself. You know, you're a little kid. You don't have any adults to protect you. Adults can do what they want. Amanda, Dan, Anya, thank you guys so much for being here and talking about this incredible, incredible piece you all put together. Dan, maybe I'll start with you. What was the Canadian residential school system? Yeah, it was... Um a network of government-funded and often church-run schools that uh, ran from the 19th century all the way through the 1990s in Canada. Indigenous children were basically taken from their parents and forced to go to these schools throughout the year. And the goal was to separate them from their communities and their traditions and assimilate them into Canadian culture. And as we explored in the piece, there were a lot of horrible things that happened in the schools. Physical, sexual abuse was rampant. They were spread throughout the country, like it wasn't yeah. just a particular region yeah. that was known for this. Parents didn't send their kids there, you know, kids were taken from families. So, so this was like an orchestrated, systematic program designed to take in all of the indigenous kids in the country, essentially, and try to assimilate them and basically stamp out their nativeness. Is that, is that essentially what it was? Yeah, and I want to add to like the means to accomplish that end were really brutal. So you can hear all sorts of examples from kids being beat for speaking their indigenous languages. And these are often kids who didn't even know how to speak English at that point in time as well. Um, you know, there was also extreme discipline, um, kids getting beat for wetting the bed because they were scared or um, stories of seeing nuns or priests um, sexually, physically abusing kids. And, and the conditions were often vile. I mean, we're talking malnutrition because of overcrowding, disease because of overcrowding. The one residential school we visited, it's colloquially known as the mush hole because mush was what the kids were fed. And often this porridge-like substance had maggots and vermin in it. And like in the same dining hall, the nuns, the administrators, the priests, they were eating roast beef and vegetables. So mm. these were really cruel places as well. A lot of the times we had learned, you know, they operated as as farms. There was like farming and agriculture, but uh, like everything that was grown there was, was sold for profit. Like they had access to some of like really nice organic food and it was just like never like absorbed back into the, to the school. Um, another thing that we learned sort of to go back to the, the separating of, you know, kids from their culture is, uh, you know, sibling groups were often sent to these schools, you know, two, two, two siblings or three siblings or four siblings. They were all given numbers, at least, you know, the school that we went to, um, one of the survivors we interviewed, Roberta, she was given a number and her sister was given a number and the school ensured that those numbers were far apart so that when they lined up, you know, to go to meals or lined up to go outside, like they weren't even going to be able to talk to each other. Like wow. it was really about separating families to that degree. You know, the, the story you, you tell of Roberta is, is very, very powerful, obviously. And one thing I wondered is, is you know, how, how did she end up there? Like how does someone like that end up in that school? Yeah, actually the parents would be threatened with truancy laws. So there would be consequences if they didn't send their kids. Um, 
and they were basically lied to. Roberta in particular, like her father had passed away when she was quite young. She had I think six or seven siblings mm -hmm. and her mother was battling some like mental health issues. And I think that's what intercepted their family into kind of like the Canadian Child Protective Services, you know, like they were coming out and that was a mechanism by which kids were also taken, you know, taken from the government for, you know, the sake of the well-being of the kid because, you know, oh, it's a single parent, she's overwhelmed, she's this, she's that. And so they were like, this will just be better. So the Royal Canadian Mount Mounted Police, they would they would come and remove kids in, commu in communities too and then take them to the schools. So this was a real, you know, state effort to get these kids into these schools and they were forcibly removed from their communities. So, you know, yes, parents were often lied to about the quality of the education, you know, if there was education at all. You know, one thing we have heard a lot is that kids were taught, you know, homemaking, but they weren't taught math, science, et cetera. So that's also a key thing. You know, what are we teaching these kids and why? And um, yeah, the police or like the federal police were a big instrumental part of this effort and they were taking them forcibly. And there's a reason why now there's, you know, according to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, which came out in Canada in 2015 and is sort of the definitive um, record that details the residential school system and its ongoing legacy all of these efforts amounted to cultural genocide. Um, and in Canada today, there are even conversations and there is a big push, I would say, to just call it genocide, not even cultural genocide, because thousands of kids died. Canada started to reckon with what happened um, with the Truth and Reconciliation Report, like Anya mentioned. But the aspect of how many kids died was they only scratched the surface mm -hmm. in that report. And the report was very inconclusive. It said, you know, we know like maybe this amount never came home, but we have no idea how they died. We have no idea the true scale of the thing. And so that's why the discoveries of these unmarked graves have really shocked the country. You know, there's an interesting balance in your piece and just reading about this between what's known and what's left to be known. You know, there seems to be a lot of gray area there. I guess I'm curious for you, Dan and, and Anya, both of you are Canadian. What did you guys know about this growing up? And, and when did you discover it, if, if you did? So I grew up in Canada, and this was never part of what we were taught in school. It wasn't part of the social studies curriculum. You know, we got this very triumphalist narrative of, like, the founding of Canada and the expansion of the frontier into the West. I have a slightly different context because... My step-grandma, even though like my only grandma, so she's my grandma, but my Kokum is uh, a Cree woman from Saddle Lake First Nation in Alberta. So I'm lucky because I have that context in my family in the sense that I grew up learning about um, Canada's you know, history and ongoing problems. I also had one really good social studies teacher in high school who went out of her way to teach us about this stuff. But other than that, it was totally, I would say, um, essentialist, sorry for the kind of jargony word, but what I mean by that is we were taught a lot of stereotypes about Indigenous people, and we were also taught to um, Dan's point about sort of Canada as this wonderful mythical place that grew into what it is today, and it's, you know, a multicultural haven, which also we could get into a whole story about how that's also a myth. But um, yeah, I think I'm lucky because I was exposed to it at home and was able to, you know, let that actually inform why I got into journalism in the first place. Oh, wow. Not dissimilar from, you know, how we were taught in, as, a, as someone who grew up in the U.S. with, like, just did not really touch right. that stuff at all. Right. Um, westward expansion, and, you know, maybe in the month of November around Thanksgiving, we'd learn about, you know, the cornucopia of the offering of, you know, and, and I only bring it up to say that, like, this isn't a Canadian problem mm. with the residential school systems. There's actually, um, just as there was, mo there were more of these schools, we called them boarding schools in the U.S., which is, you know, hopefully we'll get to in some subsequent reporting, but this isn't just a Canadian story and a Canadian problem. I mean, it does seem like in the Canadian context, you have this very, like, you have to be very careful about the word discover. We're talking about discovering bodies, discovering what happened. But, but as both of you are showing, there's, there's a version of, of this history that some people have always known. Mm -hmm. And then there's another group of people in Canada who I, I suppose have never known anything about this. 
Yeah, some, some of the indigenous people we spoke to for the story said, we don't use the word discover because our communities have always known. If anything, it's a confirmation of what was always known. Um, and the idea that like they weren't talking about it isn't true. It's just that Canadians at large weren't listening. Was that a tricky thing for you to navigate in putting this piece together? I think the learning curve for me was probably a bit greater as the one person on the team who wasn't Canadian. You know, Anya's been covering this for Vice, uh, you know, indigenous issues for, I don't know, a long, a long time. Two years almost. And so that was super helpful. Um, I used words and, you know, well-meaning words like, oh, you know, the discovery of the bodies. Oh, no, well, we're trying not to do that. You know, there was some definitely learning that happened on my end. And luckily I had these guys to sort of help me navigate yeah. that. Covering some of these stories because the word wording is like so specific and so careful. You know, I think this is a great example of an international story that has really pushed the needle on trauma-informed reporting and how trauma-informed reporting has to underpin, you know, so many stories and beats that deal with social justice, you know, um, just grave abuse of power on behalf of governments and other authorities. And so I think the thing, like none of us, when this story broke, knew exactly how to report it, but we kept asking the sources, you know, why are you wording it like this? And why do you feel this way? A, a common question I ask sources, especially, you know, after an interview is, you know, how do you feel like the media has covered, you know, your community before and how can we do better? And I think all the way along, all three of us were extremely careful about being ethical and listening to the sources and making sure that like we weren't putting together the story, they were they were putting together the story and telling us you know, what was happening, what the reality is on the ground. And then we were obviously in a position to then ask some tough questions of those in charge and get, you know, a very broad contextual piece about the history and how it's affecting lives today. And also learning about archaeology. What was found or what has been confirmed are not definitely bodies. They know that there is something below the soil, mm -hmm. most likely graves, most likely graves of children, but you can't really know exactly what's there unless you exhume. And that conversation is very, very sensitive about whether to exhume the bodies. And each community is making determinations on their own about whether to do there, that. There are some communities that don't want to dig up bodies. They, they say, okay, we've identified this as potentially a mass grave. We don't want to disturb it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And then others feel like, you know, kids need to be brought home or you know, identified in some way, it's super hard. There was no incentive for these schools to keep great records about how many kids died in their care. You know, we had heard stories about, it's sort of anecdotally, you know, if a kid went missing, you know, it's like, oh, well, we, we sent them to this other school. You know, we have a paper that says that we did that. So if this kid isn't found, you know, it's certainly not, not on us, but like, who's to say that that really happened? Um, you know, as we, we, you know, we've talked about before and we talk about in the piece, like disease and malnutrition and these things were rampant. And it's tricky because these schools, especially, you know, we went to one um, in the piece, the Mohawk Institute, the building itself that we visited wasn't the original building of the school. The first building of the school had burned down. It's located on like some 300 acres. There were subsequent buildings built. And so it's not just like, oh, go in the backyard, do a little scanning, see what you find. You know, it's not that simple. Um, and there's not great records to really know where to look, and, and to look thoroughly would take so much time and so much money. I was just thinking that a, a casual viewer of this piece might, might not really recognize how much work had to go into making it possible for you to visit the Mohawk School and spend time with Roberta and have her tell her story. In some ways, you guys had to put a lot of work into laying that groundwork, and, and Anya, you, you did a lot of that work over the last couple of years. Do you think you could talk a little bit about the work you've been doing and, and what it took to set these components up in this piece? Yeah, I think, you know, journalists have to grapple with the fact that as an institution, we're not always trusted, especially by communities that have been under or misrepresented in the media traditionally, especially if there aren't a lot of, you know, indigenous journalists at Vice, which there really should be more of. Um, so then you kind of have to approach it differently. And I'm, I'm always pretty open to listening to critiques about journalism and their trust or lack thereof and really keen to fix it. I think 
I think what was so powerful about the way we approached this story and how I've approached stories in the past is, you know, not rushing it. Journalism can be very urgent by nature because news is urgent, right? And so if we're able to sort of slow down and really listen to these folks and to these sources, especially those who don't always trust us, then we can form relationships and then go from there and take their lead. And and we did that every step of the way. And as you know, it took quite a few months for us to put this whole story together before we could even go out in the field. And, you know, I would say that's definitely one of the main ways I approach this journalism. So I'm always asking myself, why am I telling this story? And how can I make sure that it's really like, I'm not so much you know, the only storyteller were the storytellers, but the sources are the storytellers and we are a really good conduit for that. And, you know, we can then piece a bunch of different storytellers together to get a better version and a fuller version of the truth or a fulsome version of the truth. Yeah. I mean, I think there's times where it can, we just really wanted to be mindful that what we were doing wasn't extractive. And it was important that we took our time during pre-interviews, right? When we're just like doing Zoom calls and phone calls and there's not cameras rolling or, you know, th- those things we can take as long as we want. And and that was, I think, really helpful to kind of build rapport um, and to sort of earn that trust, but also for us to just get smarter and be able to be more thoughtful because then, you know, when we're with boots on the ground, um, we're bringing that kind of f- more fulsome knowledge um, and, and respect and sensitivity to the conversations. And, you know, Dan is a great interviewer and, I you know, he, I think that comes through in the piece, I think the people that we, we spoke to like appreciated that. Yeah, the interview with Roberta, the survivor that we spoke to was, I thought about that a lot, about mm-hmm. trauma-informed reporting as we were doing that. She had a horrible experience and we knew just from talking to her beforehand, kind of the outlines of that experience, but we didn't know the specifics. And I wasn't sure if we were gonna go into the specifics and I was just gonna leave, sort of leave that space open for her to fill, you know, however she wanted to narrate her story. That and was that was a long said. interview. It was a long and intense interview. And I just tried to like happened? keep it, it open. Years, and she ended up sharing things that we weren't expecting that were very graphic. The one time that my mom came to visit us, I sat on her lap and I'll, my whole visit was crying. You know, I was just so happy that she was there. After that visit though, Zimmerman came and he took me over to his office and he sat me on his lap. And that's where the abuse started after that. And then after a while, it escalated into much worse than that and uh, became a sexual assault. I don't want to go into graphics with that one, but that was the first time he assaulted me. Well, you were very present. I think like you created a space and and we created collectively a space where hopefully she felt, I mean, she did share these things. So I assume she was comfortable sharing those things because you didn't really prod a lot. It was like a really kind of, quiet interview yeah. in that way. I think a lot of communities have experiences with reporters around this topic that can be very extractive that are like, oh, and tell me what else happened and then what else happened and really just trying to like get the most salacious Yeah, bring examples. me into that moment. And it does feel like it's that balance of, of what's fresh and new versus what's always been known, right? Mm-hmm. Y- you might think this is new to me, even if you have only, I've known about it for five years. She's lived this her whole life. Mm-hmm. It's not new to her. Yeah. So there's no, there's no sense of novelty and, and, and excitement that, that journalism comes with so often. But at the same time, it's also journalism, right? right? It's not activism, it's not PR, it's not these things. So I think, you know, finding that balance and I think, you know, our interview with Wab Canoe was probably like a nice, not really a counter, but like he is a government official and like there was some kind of like taking to task or some harder questions because, you know, it is a news piece. We had to like remember that too and, yeah. and try to, just do the calculus of all of that right. And I think we accomplished it because, you know, there were different interviews serve different purposes for the for the story in that way. Something I've been thinking about since the piece is I think we managed to strike a tone where while it wasn't shaming people who didn't know about this, it was holding them accountable. So if it's new to you, you have to think about why that is. There's something that came up later in the piece and in, in, in the interview with Wab Canoe in particular, where you're talking about the, the present day legacies of this and, and you mentioned the foster care system in Canada. Can you talk a little more about what's happening with the foster care system and how that represents a continuation, an ongoing continuation of these problems? Yeah, that was really important to us because 
the legacy of the schools is, is still continuing in Canada. Indigenous children are far more likely to be taken away from their parents by Child Protective Services. And in one of the provinces we went to, Manitoba, over 90% of kids in foster care are Indigenous. So it's, it's really, wow. it's really shocking. And one of the first call to a- calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Report was this is an extension of the residential schools. It's the residential school system in another name, essentially. Just to add some context to this, too, because, you know, it came out in July after, you know, this news really first broke that, you know, two, over 200, you know, probable unmarked graves were confirmed in B.C. in May. It came out shortly thereafter that there are more kids in foster care or more indigenous kids, sorry, in foster care today in Canada than there ever were at any one time in the residential school system. So that's important. And then in Manitoba, while 90% of indigenous or kids in foster care are indigenous, only 16% of kids like province-wide are indigenous and nationwide, more than half of all kids in foster care are indigenous, while only 8% of the nationwide young population is indigenous. So it's also like a staggering, you know, a staggering overrepresentation. And um, that's why right now we're seeing in um, Canada a big push in First Nations and Indigenous communities to take over jurisdiction over child welfare. And so this is an ongoing um, narrative in Canada and more people are starting to recognize it. But the fact that there are just so many kids, more kids today than there were at the peak of residential schools is really telling. Let me end by asking you guys a question that, that the piece somewhat ends on, which is what does justice look like? I, mean, I think different, different folks have different answers to that. There's a, a whole kind of broad spectrum of, of what people are looking for. You know, Wab Canoe, who uh, we interviewed in the piece, he really feels like the efforts now should be sort of government-funded and indigenous-led. A government leading the solution to this is actually, you know, just repeating the problem. Like the residential schools were a government solution as well to a different problem. So he doesn't want it to be government led. He wants it to be government funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are calls, though, for specific apologies. Like a lot of people want the pope to apologize for the Catholic Church's role in the school. They ran a lot of the schools. Other people want church groups and like orders of nuns to release all the records they have related to the schools. So we, ha- we can't even really fully understand the scope of a problem until we have all of the records. And a lot of religious groups are still holding their records. The TRC report, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, when they released their final report in 2015, there were, you know, how many calls to action, Anya, did they have? So they were, there were 94 calls to action. And I wanted to just like take those and say that justice kind of lies with all of us right now because we all are covered in that report because it covers so many institutions from journalism to healthcare to the criminal justice system to um, foster care, as we talked about. And these are all things we all need to be doing. And we all need to be like messaging or emailing or writing letters to our elected officials. So justice, you know, a big thing that came up is when we talk about truth and reconciliation you know, are we at reconciliation? A lot of sources said no, because we're just getting to that truth part. But those calls to action are concrete steps for all of us to start thinking about our own roles so that justice can be meted out. And um, there are a lot of people working on that. And I think to Amanda's point too, I think Americans should also watch this closely because these same things have been and were, happened. they happened, are happening in the U.S. And The only difference right now is that visibility. This is a multi-year process or processes, but I think we'll all get there eventually, I hope. One has to. Well, thank you guys very much for a very, very powerful piece and for this conversation. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.